fighting in the east has come to characterize Ukraine. But Ukraine's struggle for survival and self-determination, free of corrupt governments and Russian influence, is fought on many other fronts. In this program, we'll look at four distinct challenges Ukraine faces, in addition to fighting on its borders. From cyber defense to internal defense, fixing its forces to telling the truth. Ukraine faces challenges that may determine its very survival. February 2015. A bomb explodes in Kharkiv, a city north of the Donbass region and widely considered safe. It killed three and injured at least ten. It wasn't the first attack in Kharkiv. A nightclub had been torn apart by a blast the previous November. Kharkiv was joined by Odessa with five separate bomb attacks over the past year. And in Kiev, Ukraine's capital, police have had to deal with over 250 bomb threats, closing down their metro stations on numerous occasions. In those areas where pro-Russian forces are very strong, the threat of terrorism is very high. A nightmare scenario like Syria or Iraq is far away, but the incident served to highlight how Ukrainian internal security, the police, emergency and intelligence services, play just as key a role in defending Ukraine. But the ability of Ukraine's security services to work as a unified force defending against attacks like these has been eroded by years of mismanagement. Under Yanukovych, police and secret service agencies were highly centralized and often used as personal militias for his cronies. They've recruited militia and security service officers from the time of Yanukovych, who were like God's Almighty back then. That's why to return to those times is important for them. Right now, they will never earn the money they earned before. That's why Russian offers to them are interesting. In Kharkiv, most of the saboteurs that were exposed by the security services were former militia. Yuri cites as an example that of Alexander Khodorkovsky, a former commander of the Security Service of Ukraine, or SBU, who became the leader of the pro-Russian separatists in Donetsk. Men like him are the reason, he says, that rebels were able to quickly take over administrative centers in the days following Yanukovych's flight from Ukraine. Restoring public faith in the police means reducing corruption and putting service people through rigorous retraining to serve the populace, not their own interests. Well, according to some research, um, the trust of the citizens to the national police is very, very low. It's mainly because of the uh, corruption, uh, mainly that uh, the police officers were not so supportive to normal people maybe sometimes not behave well, so the trust is very, very low. So the main challenge is to increase the trust, uh, increase the, also the participation of the society in the, in, in the security issues. So this is one of the main challenges for Ukraine. It's also a regional problem. Historically, Donbass had stronger ties to Russia and the people have long felt neglected by Kiev. And while Ukraine's counterintelligence is often very good, they lack the resources and infrastructure to prevent every attack. Lately, our intelligence is working quite efficiently, especially counterintelligence. But unfortunately, they cannot prevent all attacks. Donbass has never felt a part of an undivided Ukraine. And this is the fault of Kiev. Ukraine will only start to heal these rifts when it stands resistant to outside interference. Until then, it remains vulnerable to terror attacks aimed to further destabilize its fragile peace from within. But what about a different kind of attack, potentially just as damaging, that can't be traced definitively to a person or even a nation? The day before the Ukrainian presidential election results were announced, a hacker group calling themselves Cyber Berkut infiltrated Ukraine's central election computer systems. According to Ukraine officials, if the malicious software they installed had not been discovered and removed, it would have portrayed that ultra-nationalist right sector leader Dmitry Yarosh had won with 37% of the vote instead of the 1% he actually received. Moderate Petra Poroshenko, the actual winner with a majority of the vote, would have been placed in second with 29%. Cyber Berkut's aim? To feed into the Russian myth that Ukraine had fallen to a fascist coup. 
That evening, Russian Channel 1 aired a bulletin declaring Mr. Yarosh the winner, quoting these exact percentages. But cyber attacks can be more sinister than pushing Russian propaganda. Black Energy is a well-known cybercrime toolkit that's been in use since 2007. But over the summer of 2014, as tensions rose between Russia and Ukraine, a new version of the malware was detected being used by a mysterious group of hackers targeting Ukrainian government officials to harvest information. It's not easy to define the main resource of the cyber attack. But when we think about the results and the aim of the attacks, we can guess that these are caused by Russians. The Black Energy hackers targeted government infrastructure like the Ukrainian railway, creating proxy servers at key locations to divert traffic, which could have resulted in commuter deaths. Ukraine has a lot of serious and dangerous facilities in the chemical, nuclear sectors, and also gas pipelines. Any debilitation of these facilities could lead to very serious ecological consequences for Ukraine and for Europe. The pattern of these attacks follows political events with chilling predictability. For example, a day after the announcement of an IMF loan to Ukraine, Ukrainian banks were attacked. For Russian myth-busting site Stopfake, attacks not only follow a pattern, hackers and their junior cousins' trolls become familiar faces. The more popular the post, the more acute it is, Especially after we published evidence of Russian forces in Ukraine, we noticed. After that, we got a DDoS attack. They don't even try to hide behind proxy servers. They come straight from Russia, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Novosibirsk. We have some old faces, as we call them, and they can be recognized by their mistakes. They can change their IP address, but the grammar gives them away. While cyber defense experts can usually tell whether hackers are so-called patriotic hacking by lone actors or organized cybercrime by large institutions, the answer remains the same. Vigilant and coordinated cyber defense. Ukraine doesn't lack in expertise, but years of neglect and corruption in government institutions have led to a significant brain drain. They have enough cybersecurity experts for me, I think, but they are currently working on the private sector because He earns much money in there. And this is the main problem Ukrainian governments and Ukrainian state institutions faces. NATO has promised money for developing Ukraine's cyber defense capabilities. It's a project led by allied countries Romania and Hungary and helped by Estonia, a Baltic country who had their own massive cyber attack in 2007 that most believe originated in Russia. Eight years later, allied countries like Estonia are well-placed to help Ukraine with a tactic they and other nearby countries find so familiar. Ukrainian politicians and experts in the field of cyber defense thought we could find some middle ground between the Western position and the Eastern position, which is represented by Russia. But the latest historical events happening here, they confirm very precisely that we don't have any choice. We have to use the existing experience of the United States and NATO countries to protect critical infrastructure. NATO's experience may also help to fix a long-damaged institution that's vital to defending Ukraine, its armed forces. Ukraine's armed forces continue to defend their country against incursions by pro-Russian separatists. But it's a struggle that hasn't come easy for a force that relies heavily on conscripts and volunteers. In early summer 2014, it looked as if Ukrainian forces might prevail against pro-Russian separatists. But during a brief ceasefire, the rebels regrouped with the help of advanced weapon systems. Military journalist Yuri Butusov of news agency Sensor.net says he initially couldn't believe his eyes when he saw Russian hardware in his country. I didn't believe it. I thought it was propaganda or that somebody was seeing things. But two days later, the first post was shelled in the region of Dobropilia by the first grad. 
Deadly weapons like Grad missiles and book systems devastated Ukrainian forces, including a tragic rout at Ilovaisk, where hundreds of soldiers were killed or captured after being encircled by enemy forces. The Ukrainian armed forces at Ilovaisk were outgunned and outmaneuvered, something that many blame not on poor soldiers, but poor military planning. Our intelligence data was good, and it was provided to the Ukrainian military leadership, but the bureaucratic machinery failed and did not allow us to react properly. So the result was this tragedy. But to understand why Ukraine's armed forces found themselves on the back foot, we need to go back to the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s. The total strength of the military was almost one million when Ukraine got its independence in 1991. And for those uh, 23, 25 years, they were reduced to less than 200,000. And this has uh, enormous uh, impact. Add to these drastic reductions 25 years of mismanagement and, many believe, deliberate neglect. It's a question of deliberate underfunding for more than 20 years. Before the war, during the regime of Yanukovych, the Ministry of Defense was headed by Russian agents. Two successive ministers of defense were Russian citizens, and they completely destroyed our units of high readiness. They undermined our capabilities and actually destroyed a big portion of our equipment. The good news is that Ukraine's war has given thousands of soldiers experience in a year that would take many armies 10 to require. But to build on that experience will take careful training and mentoring, even as fighting sporadically continues despite the Minsk agreements. NATO has pledged money to improve Ukraine's armed forces through mentoring command and control structures, something the former regime resisted. Under Yanukovych, there was a backslide to a Soviet system of governance. The more this system of distribution of resources is complicated, the more opportunities there are for corruption. That's why our military leadership resisted a switch to a more simple and understandable NATO structure. If the current Soviet-style system is allowed to continue without reform, it could have devastating results. This system doesn't work because uh, this system kills initiative, kills responsibility. If uh, this system will continue, I think uh, it would be a question of more casualties and the loss of uh, territory. And while, thanks to volunteers and conscripted troops, numbers are increasing, emphasis will need to be on quality as well as quantity. We need to understand the professional level of this volunteer. If you are a patriot, if you want to fight for Ukraine, you have to be alive. You have to be effective on the front line. We don't need dead patriots. Ukraine's armed forces have long days and nights of fighting ahead of them, as well as years of caring for their wounded and developing their defenses. With no signs that fighting will cease completely, it will be a steep learning curve. But what use is a strong military if you don't have a strong message? Russia's disinformation about Ukraine has permeated worldwide media, and the fight back is tougher than ever. The information campaign against Ukraine has stepped up. From bad Photoshop jobs to professionally cast actors, the attacks on Ukraine's credibility are endless and put Ukraine in an impossible situation to try and counter. It's frustrating, but uh, I think it's... It never stops. I mean, the information war. Facing a well-funded and monolithic Russian communications machine, Ukraine just doesn't have the resources to debunk every false message. But to do nothing leaves it vulnerable to the lies gaining traction. If I talk honestly about counter-propaganda, how do you destroy the messages Russia produces? Unfortunately, they're leading in this war. For us, it's important to disseminate truthful information. We're not talking about fighting with them. We want to install channels of communication that will in return counteract the Russian propaganda that's flooded us. Truth and openness ought to be Ukraine's most powerful weapons against false news. But their ministries have been slow to disseminate information to the public, especially to conflict areas in the east. For you to understand, 
Understand that in Crimea and Donbass, there are very few people who are watching Ukrainian TV. They are watching Russian TV. The population saw the events with the eyes of the Kremlin. And when people do have access to internet, popular social media sites like Vikontaktia are primarily Russian language, making them hotbeds of easily shareable false images and rumors. As for the occupied territories, there are some citizens that are pro-Ukrainian, but because of their situation, they cannot do anything. The setting up of a Ministry of Information policy was a well-intentioned but unpopular step to try and synchronize Ukraine's communications. Almost no one in Ukraine doubts Russia is waging an information war, but the best way to respond is still hotly debated. If we talk about communications, then we talk about introducing a national identity and a common understanding that can unite us and bring us closer to victory. Building credibility also means self-regulating. Ukrainian media aren't immune to making mistakes and falling for false news. They just spread without thinking. I mean, just if something might look like anti-Russian, Ukrainian media or just, you know, separate Ukrainian bloggers or whatever, they can start spreading it around without double check. Building a new Ukraine that is inclusive, modern and prosperous is a challenge that seems insurmountable. But the strength and will that started the Euromaidan can still be seen in volunteers like Margot and in a new open media that puts truth before a good story. We have this saying that on our, the truth and God is on our side. And that's why the best way is to show the truth we have. Eventually, truth wins over and so you just need to show it. But Ukraine's future depends not just on how strongly the government, the armed forces and even the people stand by their intentions, but also how much its friends are willing to support it through what may be one of its defining moments in its modern history.